Hey, everybody. Hello, everybody. Thank you. It's like the first time I tried to talk to my wife. She ignored me. That has changed, yes. Well, we have three kids now, so. There she is. I had to earn it. I had to earn it. She's not mad, Glenn. No. No, she loves me. Love you guys. I'm glad you're here. Tonight is our Wednesday series, the continuation of it. Back to the Bible. We are exploring what the Bible says. A lot of times, whenever we talk about God or the teachings that God has, statements will be made like this. I feel like. Well, that's not the place we start. Our feelings come secondary to what God has said and what God has established. And so we are going to, in our very best, continue in that series tonight. Chris Presnell is here tonight. He's the preacher at the Flint Church of Christ. His family is sitting right back here, and you can see all of them. Anna, Cade, and Tara, uh, smiling, excited to support him. I'm grateful for them. That Flint is where a lot of my family members go. And so Chris is a special preacher because he deals with my special family. And I'm grateful for him for that. He's also a special man because he has a heart for mission. Not just mission as you might think overseas, in which case he is also preparing to go there. Hopefully to talk to people in a country, what country was that again? Kyrgyzstan, where we don't know if there is there are any Christians gathering. No known church in Kyrgyzstan. And so he a door has been opened and he's preparing to make that trip to meet with folks to take the gospel there. That's great. But the mission isn't there, it's also here. I've been on conversations with them where he was excited to get into the school system to be able to teach, build relationships, and influence people for Christ. That's why he's here. Because we respect his ability to teach, his maturity in the knowledge of the word, and uh, God's gift to him to speak it. And so, uh, let's, let's sit at the feet of our Lord tonight, open up your Bibles, and I'll pray, Chris, and then it'll be your time to get up and speak. Holy Father, we're grateful to be able to gather around your word. We want to exalt you and lift you up to place you at the highest place above all else. Let's not get lost, Father, in the celebration of a man. While we're grateful for Chris and his family, he is but a mouthpiece tonight. And so we pray that our eyes will be focused on you. Our attention will be given to your word. That you will use him as a spokesperson this evening. But the true message comes from you. And it will be implanted in our hearts. And so work on us tonight, Lord. And we pray we allow you to do your work of transforming us by your word from the inside out. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for the opportunity of being here this evening. And uh, if you are correct, Austin and I get to preach to your special family. Uh, All of them. (laughs) Well, not all of them, but a lot of them. Uh, His grandparents have been there, several of his uh, cousins and their families and his uh, aunt and uncle. So we are very blessed at Flint to be Johnson Rich, if you know what I mean. And uh, I know that you're blessed to have Austin and his wife here and their family because Austin is just a true blessing uh, to the kingdom of God. And I appreciate him very much. He does a fantastic job. We call on Austin a lot. Uh, to speak uh, at different events, especially involving uh, some folks at Maywood and our Lift University that we're engaging in, and uh, also does a phenomenal job of that. He's been on our summer series over at Flint, has done a fantastic job, so I just appreciate him very, very, very much, and I appreciate all of you. It has probably been over 20 years since I've been here to Florence Boulevard, uh, since my father-in-law preached here for a brief time. Uh, in the late 90s, early 2000s, Terry Broom. And so uh, I'm thankful to be able to come and, and join you again because it has been some time since I've had the privilege of being able to be here with you. Tonight, uh, I've been given the topic, I'm a divorced Christian, what now? And it is. It is a, a difficult topic. Uh, I was conversing with somebody about that, and 
And uh, I, I said, you know, really, whenever you get a topic like this, it's only because the people that are bringing you in intend for you to be here once. And so I appreciate the opportunity to speak here once. And uh, once this is over with, you know, I look forward to seeing all of you again in heaven because uh, I probably won't be asked back, right? You know, uh, we're going to do the very best that we can tonight. We're going to look at several scriptures together. Uh, I want us, as Austin mentioned in his prayer, to remember that this is not about me, it's about God's Word. And we're going to give attention to God's Word on the subjects that we're going to be dealing with here this evening. So if you want to go ahead and mark your Bible to the two texts that we're primarily going to use tonight, we're going to be looking at Matthew chapter 19 and 1 Corinthians chapter 7. So you can go ahead and mark your position there at those particular places. So this is such an important topic. And quite honestly, it is a touchy subject. It is a subject that a lot of people have a lot of feelings about and a lot of thoughts about. And so we want to look at it. But before we get into the meat of the lesson, and I really have about three areas we're going to cover tonight. I want to break it down into about three different areas. We're going to deal with those. There are a few things I want to get straight from the get-go. The first thing that I want us to get straight is this. Number one, although God hates divorce, and we're familiar with that, he does not hate the divorcee. He doesn't. Now, sometimes we get a little confused with that. Maybe we get a little sideways on that. It's important to remember that God hates many things. Go to Proverbs chapter 6. Look at that particular passage of Scripture. It's going to tell you at least seven things that are an abomination to God. And so you look at those things and you remember that God hates a lot of things, not just divorce. He's just as disappointed and hurt when we give in to any kind of sin in our life. He hates it when I'm guilty of gossip or when I have impure thoughts. He hates it when I'm acting in an unkind manner or when I'm behaving selfishly. He even hates it when I have a fit of rage. There's a lot of things that God hates. But I know one thing. He doesn't hate me. He doesn't hate you. But for whatever reason, some people judge divorce as a way to your sin. You know, we've got the big ones, right? Uh, we can go through the list of sins found in Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 20, and, and look at the works of the flesh. And We can identify sexual immorality and impurity and sensuality and, and all of these different things like that. In fact, he uses that phrase at the very end when he's dealing with that entire list of works of the flesh and such like. So really he's saying the list doesn't end here. But you know what? We forget about some of the other things like what? Yeah, like slander or envy. Folks, those are works of the flesh just like sexual immorality or impurity. And so we've got to remember that divorce is not a weightier sin by way of the fact that it's a worse because somebody has been divorced, than anybody else that commits any other sin. And I think we've got to think about that. Now, we think about consequences, and certainly uh, consequences of sin may be a little heavier. Number two, the thing that we need to remember tonight is that a divorced person is somehow demoted to secondary Christian status. That is just ridiculous, isn't it? That's nonsense. That when you become a divorced person that now you enjoy secondary Christian status. Frustrations happen for divorced people, and I understand that. As a minister, you get an opportunity to talk with people, and you get to hear their stories, and you get to listen to some of the things that they're going to discuss, and they're going to vent some things, and they're going to share some of the frustrations. I want to share some of the frustrations that people from divorce have expressed about the church family and, and with me even. You know, they, they'll say something like, well, I just feel guilty and ashamed. They'll say something like, I'm caught between looks of pity and accusation. Like, they just don't look at me the same anymore, right? Where do I fit? You know, it's awkward with the singles now, but it's equally awkward being the third wheel with my married friends. Where do I find time? You know, when I used to be able to do a lot of different things, now I'm juggling between taking care of family and maybe 
job and maybe the household chores and all of these. So, so I don't even have time if I wanted to be engaged or active with my brethren at the church. Maybe I just don't find that time. I just can't find the time to be what I need to be. You know, church, first thing we've got to remember is we've got to do a better job of helping these Christians through this horrible, hurtful, and for many of them, humiliating experience. You know, you think about it. I think our hearts ought to go out to them because what happens is their sin ends up being lived out in front of everybody. Where I can keep mine hidden, right? The problems that I've got, I left my son's video with me, uh, they, they stay with Chris. I don't have to play mine out in front of everybody else in the world, but sometimes that's what happens here with divorce. And so they're at a disadvantage. And I think it's important for us to rally around them and to help them and to love and embrace these folks and help them not feel like that they are second-class Christians. Now, having said all of that, the second aspect of what I want to discuss tonight is this. Where do I stand? Where do I stand? Because there's a lot of people that need clarity on the subject of divorce. And it's something that even is needed in the church. Clarity on the subject. I'm not surprised when people come into my office and they sit down and they want to talk about their marriage and they're not associated with the congregation at all. I've had that happen. I've had people contact me and say, hey, listen, uh, we're friends of so-and-so that attends there and we understand that maybe you would talk to us about our marriage situation. We're struggling with some things. We need some help. Would you be willing to help? I said, sure, come on. We'll sit down and we'll talk. And they'll come to my office and I am amazed at what they say. They don't have any understanding. I remember one particular situation on one occasion. I, again, I won't give out any names or anything like this. You don't know these folks. And, and, and quite honestly, they came for a day. And I'm not sure I can remember their names. I'd have to go back and look it up. I don't even know their names. But I know that they came into my office one day. And they said, we are getting a divorce. We cannot stand each other anymore. And I don't want to be with him. He doesn't want to be with me. In fact, he's, he's thinking about trying to find somebody else. I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. He had not yet, but he was working on it. He even admitted it. Said, yeah, yeah, there's another person that I really kind of like. And, but we came to you as a last-ditch effort to try to help us with our marriage relationship. And I said, okay, woo, let's talk. And let's get out God's Word. I said, but before I can say anything to you or help give you guidance biblically, I'm going to need to know a little bit more about the background of your situation. And so he begins to say, well, she's angry with me now, and it's because I am not there enough. I just don't spend enough time with her. And she said, yeah, that's right. I mean, he is, he is off on his own. He's doing his own thing. He's never with me. I never have any time with him. He doesn't show me any affection or, or love or, or that I'm that he's grateful that I'm his wife, or any of those things. And I said, okay. And he said, I guess that I did that because my first wife, I was a hoverer. I went, okay, whoa. Let's pump the brakes. Let's pump the brakes. All right, so now I need to know a little bit more about the situation. So what was the problem with the first wife? He goes, well, I just smothered her. I think that I was too in her face all the time and she just couldn't handle that and put up with it and so eventually we just decided you know no go so i said okay let's talk to you let me talk to you about the bible and what the bible says it says really you two don't have a right to be together you need to either reconcile with your first wife or remain unmarried and you, well, you've been living in fornication and committing sin, but free. Do you know what happened? This is the most amazing thing. They came into my office, found and determined that they wanted a divorce. Both of them said, we 
don't want to be. And I think they were initially looking for me to give them the okay to do it. Yes, go ahead. And then when I began to talk to them, and I actually told them that they could, you know what they did? They walked out of there. And I mean, we cried about it, and I talked to them, and I said, listen, it does not bring me any great joy to share this kind of information with you, because I know it's going to hurt you. And it's not because I'm ashamed of what God's Word said. I'm not ashamed of what God's Word said. I'm here to tell you about God's Word. I'm here to defend God's Word, because that's what we've got to do, and that's what's most important. I have to honor that. But it doesn't bring me great joy to see somebody in pain and to bring hurt on somebody. And so emotionally, I know that you're tore up. And so I called them the next day to check on them. You know what they said? They said, we just don't agree with you, and we're going to stay married. And that's what happened. So where do I stand in some of these situations? What about this? I've been unfaithful, which led to the divorce. What does Jesus say in Matthew 19.9? Well, remain unmarried or reconcile. You know, it's up to the other person. I mean, there's two parts to this. But it is a possibility that even though there has been an indiscretion in that relationship, the marriage can be saved. It doesn't have to end in divorce. So, but if you're the one that's been unfaithful, Jesus says the only reason the marriage and divorce and remarriage they are divorce and remarriage is for sexual immorality. So if you've been the unfaithful one, remain unmarried. Or if your spouse is gracious, be reconciled if that's an option. What about this? My spouse was unfaithful, which led to the divorce. Well, if the spouse was unfaithful and it led to the divorce, you can reconcile. You have that option. You can show grace and mercy and work through these things. Or, Jesus says, you can remarry. That's Matthew 19, 9. What about this? My spouse and I divorced for irreconcilable differences, incompatible personality, financial issues, whatever the case may have been. Well, according to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 10 through 11, you can stay unmarried or reconciled. What did Paul, the Apostle Paul write? What about these three? My spouse and I divorced because of abuse, physical, verbal, substance. My spouse and I divorced because of some type of illness, physical or mental. My spouse and I divorced because of some family tragedy. You know, that happens sometimes. A lot of times families go through these horrible tragedies, and for whatever reason, it just tears that relationship up. Well, each of these is the same as number three. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 11. Either remain unmarried or be reconciled. That's what Paul is going to write. This is what Jesus is going to share in these passages. So where do I stand? All right. Well, let's look at this. Some people might ask, well, what about 1 Corinthians 7, 12 through 16 and an unbelieving spouse? Well, folks, you have to interpret this passage of Scripture in light of Matthew 19, 9. And verse 16 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Let's go back and let's just take a look at these texts together. So we're going to read these now and look at them. And then hopefully this will even give you more clarity as we study. Let's begin in verse 9 of Matthew 19 and read through verse 12. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if such is the case of a man with his wife, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not everyone can receive this thing, but only those to whom it is given. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth, and there are eunuchs who have been made eunuchs by men, and there are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. Let the one who is able to receive this, receive it. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Again in verse 10, here's what Paul says to the married. I give this charge, not I but the Lord. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and the husband should not divorce his wife. 
To the rest I say, I, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he should not divorce her. If any woman has a husband who is an unbeliever and he consents to live with her, she should not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is made holy because of his wife, and the unbelieving wife is made holy because of her husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbelieving partner separates, let it be so. In such cases, the brother or sister is not enslaved. God has called you to peace. For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? So what about the unbelieving spouse that departs? You know, there's been a lot of discussion about this over the years. There have been many who have taken the position that, well, yeah, you're, you're free, right? That's what he said. Uh, you're at peace. Well, what is that? Well, when you interpret that in light of Matthew chapter 19, 9 and verse 16, you understand that you're not necessarily saying there's freedom to remarry again. You're just free from that marriage that you were a part of. You don't have to worry about trying to make that work. If they depart, they depart. You're, you've been called to peace. And we get that in light of what he says here in Matthew 19, 9, because what did Jesus say? Jesus says the only reason for remarriage is for sexual immorality. That's number one. We've got to interpret these things together. And we can look at verse 16. And when you look at verse 16 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, what's he saying here? For how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? It looks as though, and the idea here is, you are leaving the door open for them to get their life right again. How do you know what may happen? I realize that people will say, you know, you're being judgmental, insensitive, and completely detached. My wife said those things before, okay? I can truly say also that I don't always understand God's reasons or decisions. Is there somebody here in this audience who can tell me that you understand every one of God's decisions and every one of God's reasons? I can't. You know, me and my human mind says, well, this seems like this would be okay. Uh, or, you know what, I just don't understand why God would, would do this, right? I mean, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me but I don't have the wisdom of God. I don't understand all of his ways. They're not for me to understand all of them. God is so far above me, his understanding so far above mine, that it's pitiful for me to even sit here and discuss that. And it would be pitiful for anybody else to discuss their intellect in relation to God and their understanding in relation to God's understanding. So what should I remember? I should remember that when interpreting these passages, there can be no contradictions. You see, folks, the Holy Spirit's not confused. I might be confused. It may take me some time to study through these things and figure out what it is that he's trying to say, but I can assure you the Holy Spirit's not confused. He knows what he's talking about. And so what he got in Matthew to write from Jesus and what he got in Paul to write in his epistles will complement and supplement but never contradict. It'll complement, it'll supplement, but it will not contradict. And so whenever we're looking at these things, we have to look at them together. you got some people that say, well, I know that's what Jesus said over here in Matthew, but it looks like Paul said something different. No, 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 no. The Holy Spirit's not confused. And the Holy Spirit is intelligent enough to be able to provide us with a document where there are no contradictions. We should remember the following. We live in a fallen world, and not everything in our life is going to be fair. It's not. People will say, well, it's not fair that I can't have a relationship like everyone else now. That doesn't seem fair to me. There are times, folks, when we will have to make sacrifices 
and experience unwanted circumstances. You know, I don't think that it was Jesus' wish to have to endure a cross like he did. He prayed about it. He said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. But not my will, thine be done. Here is your Savior giving you an example of exactly what we're talking about. He didn't want to go to the cross. He knew sacrifices had to be made. He knew that the experience wasn't going to be pleasant. It wasn't really wanted either in his fleshly nature. He didn't want to have to endure and suffer that. But he said, I'm going to do your will as uncomfortable as this is going to be. And Paul did the same thing, right? I mean, you think about the Apostle Paul. He did the same thing. He put himself to the hazard. He endured hunger and thirst and shipwreck and all of these different things so that he might be able to deliver the gospel to people. You know, he could have said, you know, I don't think Peter has it this bad. Or certainly John. Oh, my goodness. The golden child of the apostles, right? The one that Jesus loved. I don't think they got it as bad as I do. That's not what he said. Folks, this may just be the cross that you have to carry for the short duration that you live here on this earth. But here's something else that we need to Remember, don't let sexuality and physical relationships become your idol. We've done that in America. The liberation of sexuality in all its forms has become the focus of American policy. Think about it. Think about decisions that are being made now. It's the liberation. Of, and what does that really say? It's really saying this, sex and relationships, that's the one thing we can't live without and shouldn't have to. Shouldn't have to live without that, right? Now, here, this is not a, a lesson or a sermon on sex um, because I'm generally fa in favor of it, okay? You know why? Because God is in the right context. Now, I think we do our young people a lot of times a disservice when we don't talk about sexuality in a positive way. Sex is beautiful. It's holy in the confines of the marriage relationship. That's what he says. Marriage is honorable and all, the bed undefiled. Whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. I said, this is something that's beautiful. It's something good. So I'm not here to try to downplay the holiness of, of the matrimony that God has established. But what I am trying to say is this. Sometimes when we get in these situations where God has established some parameters for us, he says, this is when you can, this is when you can't. This is when those relationships have to be severed. We decide to try to devise a way so that we can have it, or at least try to rest the scriptures, come up with some type of interpretation that would give allowance for that. Folks, it's not scriptural. The one thing that we can't live without and shouldn't have to, therefore we must devise a way so that everyone can, that's not scriptural. I mean, the Bible speaks explicitly about fornication, right? So until you're married, that can't happen, right? What else should I remember? I can't do it. That's what you hear certain people say. You know, I just can't live like that. I can't do that. I have to have somebody. I have to have a relationship. Really, in essence, what that translates to is this, God, you're not enough for me. You're not enough. You're not strong enough to help me be able to overcome these desires. You are not good enough that I want to have you in place of these things. That's basically what we're saying, and that's what I meant when I said a moment ago, we have made sexual uh, things and relationships our idol. We say, I can't do that, right? It's not the case. It can be done. Listen to Christ and Paul again. In Matthew chapter 19, 
You go back to that particular passage of Scripture, and, and here, when Jesus is teaching, these people are shocked. I mean, they're kind of shocked and awe when Jesus is sharing this information. And, and when he gets to verse 9, it says, And I say to you, now he's already talked about the problems that they already had, and how that because of the hardness of their hearts, Mar Moses had allowed them to give writings of divorcement. But from the beginning, it was what? It was not so. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. Now, the passage I want us to focus on is this. They ask, hey, in this case, it'd be better for a man not to even marry his wife, right? And Jesus says, not everyone can receive this saying, but only the, those whom it is given. Now, what Jesus is saying is not, hey, you know what? Some of you can handle this and some of you can't. That's not what he's saying. Although that may be how some people read that. Yeah, not all of you can receive this say. No, no, no. What he means by that is not all of you are going to accept it and be obedient to it. Same, same meaning of he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's not saying to some folks, you know, you don't have to listen if you don't want to. Right? And, and that what that sounds like, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He's not giving you an out to say, you know what, if you don't listen to that, it doesn't apply to you. That's not what he's saying. It does apply to you. And so what he says here is this. For there are eunuchs who have been so from birth. They were born having to forfeit those kinds of relationships. There are others who have been made so by men. And there have been some who have made themselves eunuchs. Why? For the kingdom of God. Because they said, God, you're enough. You're enough. And then Paul, he tells them to remain unmarried or be re reconciled in 1 Corinthians 7, 10 through 12. They wouldn't say it if it weren't possible. If it weren't possible. So what should I do? Now that I'm a divorced Christian, what now? What should I do at this point? Well, I've got four points. Whew, that was the first bell. I thought I got the first bell at 10 after, Austin. Not five after. Okay, uh, no, that's okay. I'll, I'll try to squeeze you in here. What should I do? Number one, pour yourself into the work of the kingdom. That's what you should do. Pour yourself into the work of the kingdom. Matthew 19, 12. There have been men who have made themselves eunuchs. Why? For the kingdom of God. I know several people that are, are divorced. I know several people that are divorced that they are the reason for their divorce. And I also know that they are some of the strongest Christian individuals I've ever met. Because they didn't throw in the towel. They didn't say, oh, poor pitiful me, look at what all I've lost. No, no, no. I know one lady who handles VBS at my congregation at Leak the Kitchen who handles crafts at a Christian camp for an entire week, who helps the girls at our congregation do song leading, who is about to embark on a two-week mission trip in the Caribbean, who has raised four godly Christian children. One of the strongest Christian women I know, she's divorced. Pour yourself into the work of the kingdom. That's what you can do. Number two, you can focus on your family. You know, even in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 13 through 16, I know that this is maybe a little bit of a stretch, but uh, the idea here when you look at verse 16 is uh, the spouse is supposed to be considering the husband or the wife and what's going to happen with them. If they're doing that for someone that they may be separated from, how much more should they be doing that for their children to make sure that they remain in Christ and holy? Because... We've already talked about the passage of Scripture. It says, hey, if you've got an unbelieving husband or an unbelieving wife, it's okay. Your children are holy because of you. Because of that relationship that y'all remain in as a one Christian and one non-Christian. So focus on your family. Uh, do time with, spend time with them. Uh, make sure that you are teaching them and instructing them. And that is now your purpose uh, in life. What about this? 
Work on being holy in body and spirit. I want us to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7 because here the Apostle Paul, maybe we just don't pay attention to this enough, but it's really the purpose why he's addressing all of these questions and all of these issues here. This is what he's trying to get everybody to see. So beginning in verse 32, he says, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. He's showing that difference right there. Saying, you need to work on being holy in body and spirit. Your allegiances do not need to be divided. You can do that. That's what he's talking about here in this. And then finally he says this. Give your undivided devotion to the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7.35 He says, I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Now we understand why he was writing these things. There was a present distress that caused Paul to give some encouraging thoughts to the people and, and some advice, some spiritual advice about, hey, this might not be the right time to get married. I would spare you some of the problems. So we understand the context within what he's writing here. But that's what he's saying. I'm not doing this to lay a restraint on you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. That should be our goal, each and every single one of us. So I'm a divorced Christian. What now? Pour yourself into the work of the kingdom. Focus on your family. Work on being holy in body and spirit. And give your undivided devotion to the Lord. Thank you so much for your time tonight.
I'd like to welcome everyone, have a few announcements to make before our devotional period. Jan Reeves uh, has COVID pneumonia, and she's in Nancy, and they're requesting no visit this time, so keep hearing your prayers. I'd like to express her sympathy to the family Shelby Trousdale. Ms. Shelby passed away on uh, Monday, and her visitation will be from 11 a.m. until 1 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, with the funeral following at 1 o'clock, and that'll all be here at the church building. There are several items that are in the family room that need to be moved out tonight. If you can help with these, please see Mark Van Horn. If you brought food for the Wilford family, uh, your dishes are in the dish room. Remember the girls' Devo, that will be July 31st. as a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board if you'd like to participate in this. The Johnsons are going to be uh, on vacation next week, so Brian Jarrett will be preaching both services. <clears throat> Prime time is your trip to Maywood. Uh, tomorrow has been canceled. That's all the announcements I have. At this time, we'll begin our devotion. The first song will be number 410, He Leadeth Me. Song before the invitation or the devotional tonight will be 475. Uh, glory to his name. And if you would, let's stand for this song.
much for being here this evening. Uh, I appreciate very much in the announcement uh, that you're praying for the work in Haiti. Uh, many of you are familiar with Harry Haynes, I guess, uh, who uh, is a member at the Flint Congregation and helps to oversee the work uh, that's going on uh, over there uh, and knows John Claubert, uh, Belton, and all of the folks at Croix de Bouquet. So thank you so much for uh, praying for them. We hope that things are going to get better very soon so we can get back over there and do some of the mission work that we were doing before. So again, it's been a privilege to be able to be with you uh, tonight. I have my precious granddaughter here with me this evening. Her name is Addison. She's eight years old. And uh, I'll tell you a little story. One day uh, I was in the kitchen doing some cleaning. And I, I don't know what came over me that day, but I was trying to move some things around and sweep out from under the refrigerator, make sure that everything looked good. But it seemed like it was one of those days where everything I touched, I broke. I have the broom in my hand. I'm doing a little sweeping. I reach over, hit something. Broom handle hits something, knocks over. My granddaughter's standing there. And I hit one of my wife's favorite mugs. It shattered on the floor. My granddaughter, nanny, nanny, nanny. She goes running back to the back of the house where my wife is. I got something to tell you. And she said, what is it, sweetheart? Poppy broke your favorite mug. Addison, mmm. <laughs> so I'm working a little bit longer. And I'm going to move a china cabinet around. Well, when my wife and I got married, a sweet lady decided that she was going to make a special gift for us. I, and y'all, I know that my son is going to take my man card away for this, uh, and, and it's going to happen just as sure as I say it. But I remember that our everyday wear was false graph tea rose when we got married. We've been married 28 years, and our china is Chandon. Uh, is Chandon. Never used it. I don't know why that sticks out to me, but I remember, well, a lady had taken one of those false graph plates, and she had made a clock for us that we hung up in our house. Well, the battery had died, and I had sat it on top of the china cabinet. Well, guess what? I moved the china cabinet, and I was sweeping behind that. That thing fell off, hit me in the head, and shattered all over the floor. Once again, nanny, nanny. I've got good news and bad news. Bad news is Poppy broke your plate. But the good news is it hit him in the head first. <laughs> you know, so tonight, when I talk to you, there's good news and bad news. I mean, when we think about spiritual things, we have to come to grips with the good news and that there is some bad news. The bad news is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's bad news. What Paul says is, for those that choose not to accept Jesus, to be obedient to Him, to obey that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, flaming fire. He goes on to describe it a little bit further from the presence of the Lord. That's bad news. But there's also good news. Romans 8 1 says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. So tonight, the news doesn't have to stay bad. If you're not a Christian, if you need to get your life right with Jesus Christ, you have the opportunity to do that as we stand and sing this invitation song.
We'd like to thank everyone for coming out to, for coming out this evening, and we'd like to invite you back for our worship service on Sunday morning at nine o'clock with our uh, Bible classes immediately following. We'll sing uh, just the first verse, just of "Abide with Me," and then we will be led in our closing. Oh. Uh. who are taking care of her, and we just ask that you heal her and that she have a quick recovery. Also, Lord, we ask that you please be with the Miss Shelby Trousable family and, and her recent loss, and we just pray that you help them to, to comfort them and to help bring them peace, Lord. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. <laughs> 